Kaplan. We must learn to take our tradition seriously without taking it literally. To take it seriously, we have to identify the psychological postulates or demands implied in whatever it teaches. The tradition's important, and he's a serious man. What he's looking for is the spirit behind the word and not the word. What we might call the true meaning of the word. Roughly speaking, that's the outline. And I think the important thing is to look at those three lines at the bottom. The intention of this class is to detail some of the major influences on Kaplan's thought, to describe some of the core values that he derived from his American experience, and to explore Kaplan's view of God. Uh, the last is, I think, in some ways, the most interesting, the most controversial, the most difficult, the most challenged. Uh, but let's see how he got there. I love this quote. I absolutely adore it. Whatever ought to be can be, even though it is not at present in existence. It is such a picture of Kaplan's optimism about the nature of the universe, about the fact that there is order and purpose. That which ought to happen, if it is good, can be made to happen. In a sense, it is both a creed and a call to action. Background. Education, career, writings. That's a good summary. Biography is not destiny, but it helps to understand this particular man. His life was very long. It overlapped ours. His world was both not our world and our world. If you think about it, he went from the experience of pogroms to the experience of the founding of Israel, from the horse and buggy to men walking on the moon. He was born in 1881 in a town outside of Vilna. 1881 was a terrible year for Jews in the Russian Empire. In the aftermath of the assassination of a liberal czar, Alexander II, a massive repression began. Alexander III uh, relied strongly on advice from his minister, Pobyedinostov, who had been his tutor when he was younger. Pobyedinostov engaged in a massive uh, project of Russification and a particular attack against any of the religions that were not the Russian Orthodox. In particular, he had a program for the Jews. And he would solve the Jewish problem in, in the Russian Empire with one third could be induced to convert, one third could be in, um, forced into uh, emigration, and one third would die. From the mid 80s on, the restrictions on Jewish life in the Russian Empire intensified. A reduction of the number of places where you could live, the occupations you could follow, a decrease in the quotas for education, and the start of a whole series of pogroms. Rabbi Israel Kaplan, who was Mordechai Kaplan's father, chose to emigrate, and he did so in 1889. Kaplan, as I said, was born in 1881. So he was, lived in, in Lithuania for about eight years. Came from an interesting family. His father was connected to the Musar tradition, which is an ethical Judaism characterized by introspection, a study of texts, a sense of responsibility, a conscience. His mother came from a Hasidic family, and obviously his father from a Mitnagdic one. And Kaplan said that he had the best of both worlds, because what he had was um, a tradition of piety and a quest for beauty, as well as a tradition of sincerity and ethics. Now, people like me, who are also the product of that kind of intermarriage, can testify to how incredibly rich it is. So his father left in 1889, and mother 
Matala and two, children, two sisters went to her brother in Paris, where he actually went to a public school, became briefly Maurice, and learned enough French to manage. But after six months, he was in the Lower East Side of New York. Motala transformed himself into Mark. Uh, and he had some public school, but not very much. He had a very lopsided education. By the way, he became Mordechai when he was at JTS, when one of the teachers suggested that Mordechai was probably a better name for him than Mark. I don't say this because it's cute, though I think it is, but because it gives us a sense of this is a human being who is molding himself into new environments all the time. What was his education? As I said, he had a little bit of, pub of public school. Certainly he was educated at home. His house was a gathering place for scholars. Arnold Ehrlich, the biblical criticism man, used to come on Friday nights to pick Rabbi Kaplan's brains on the way certain words are used in the Talmud. His father uh, had him tutored by Joseph Susnitz, who was a mathematician, a physicist, a philosopher, and a chassid. Father had a very broad sense you know, of tolerance, of difference. Kaplan said that I, he taught me to synthesize the spirit of religion with that of science. And it served him well. At 12, he entered the Jewish Theological Seminary's preparatory school. I and mean, this is a hothouse education, if ever there was one. And the curriculum was very modern. He studied with Ehrlich, got involved very deeply in biblical criticism. He went on to the City College of New York, which was, as a free university, was a hotbed of immigrants. It was a wonderful, exciting place to be. Again, it was a, a mixed world, but it was an intense one. And in the morning, he went to CCNY, and in the afternoon, he went to JTS. The hot house gets hotter. He graduated and went on to Columbia for a master's degree, which he got in 1902. Uh, he did a thesis on a British utilitarian philosopher whom I had never heard of until I started looking into Kaplan's life. He studied Talmud with his father all through this, but he says, one, I would have rather been out in the street playing ball. Two, it became less and less relevant to me, not the playing ball, uh, as I got older. He wrote in his journal, and he kept these diaries for a very long time. There are 20, what is it, 27 volumes of them that Mel Skult has been um, editing. He wrote in his journal that the reason he had so much difficulty writing is that he never had a real education and he never had a teacher who cared enough about him to help him over the humps. There is a life after JTS. They weren't ordaining then, so as a newly minted minister, he got a job at a large Orthodox congregation in New York. This already set up all kinds of controversy that a JTS graduate uh, was pretending to be the rabbi at an Orthodox congregation. He hated it. He actually thought of leaving to sell insurance. Uh, how persuasive he would have been is another question. But the point is that why did he hate it? He began to realize that he, that, he, that he had a congregation of people who blindly followed things he could no longer accept. And he didn't belong there. He was very lucky. He gave a lecture in 1909 at a, at a alumni function at JTS, and Solomon Schechter tapped him, literally, to be the new head of the, op the JTS Teachers Institute that was opening. Um, Kaplan said it saved his life. It certainly saved the rest of us from his selling insurance. Uh, and he stayed at JTS for his entire career. Um, first at Teachers Institute and then at the seminary itself. At some point, a group of members of the Orthodox congregation wanted to start a new 
Shul, and that was the origin of the um, Society for the Advancement of Judaism. He had a broad view of what you wanted. A shul was not just a place in which you davened, it really was a center which would bring Jews together. One of the things he was concerned with all of his life was, in fact, bridging the gap among Jews. As for his early writings, as early as 1915, he said, and I haven't got the quote in front of me because it didn't print, um, but he, he said that it's probably necessary to change some rituals to go back to their original function to give them meaning. Okay, let's go to the environment. Okay, first of all, what everybody confronted, and that was true in Europe, was the Enlightenment, secularism, science. The Enlightenment and science raised questions about the authority of Torah, about traditional interpretations, about man's relationship to God and to law, to Jewish law. Secularism had its own attractions and um, concerns. In the American secular state, there was concern as people became interested in building a homeland in Eretz Israel and allegations of dual allegiance. The biggest thing, though, it seems to me, sitting from where I'm sitting, was the loss of community. The loss of community was both a loss of social control. Kids went anywhere. This was a big world they were suddenly in. Uh, and a loss of the tightness and mutual support that was available in the shtetl. Uh, I always thought that what Kaplan wanted to do with the community center was not recreate the shtetl, but recreate the world that the shtetl, the opportunities that the shtetl gave. You were taking the good and you could get rid of the czar. What were American Jews like 1900 to 1934? First of all, there was mass immigration, urbanization, and family dislocation. Now, I don't know how many of you have read Irving Howe's World of Our Fathers. Howe insists that the early immigrants uh, tended to be those who were less tied to the tradition, those who would more easily take the opportunities uh, that the new world offered. But urbanization was also an interesting thing. If you think about it, most Jews did not live in metropolitan areas. They came from towns. They came from villages in Eastern Europe. New York was a, a crowded, polyglot, teeming city with both opportunities and pitfalls. And as for family dislocation, I suspect a lot of us had people in our families where a father went to the new world, leaving his wife and children behind and somehow forgot he had them. So there was a lot of family dislocation. There was a culture and values conflict between novelty and individualism of the new world, the quest for progress, and the communitarianism of the old world, the reliance on tradition uh, and the kind of social control that, that that implied. On the other hand, there was New York. And New York opened up all kinds of opportunities. We can argue as to how much melting actually ha happened in the melting pot. Those of us who came through it and didn't melt completely tend to think it wasn't quite as much, but the attempt was to have a melting pot. Uh, the schools in particular in the 20s and 30s, and probably before, but I wasn't around uh, to know very much about that at that point, consciously taught Americanization. I have to say that when I was in high school in the 1940s in home ec, we were taught how, and I put it this way, Americans set the table. Okay, it was that kind of um, molding. So Jews confronted democracy, individualism, pluralism, and modernity. And how, in fact, did they confront them? Kaplan found 
contemporary Ju uh, Judaism wanting. The reform, he thought the break with the past was, was too extreme. The agenda was rationalism uh, in place of unquestioning faith, to replace particularist prayers and practices, some of which the uh, powers that be in the reform movement thought were old fashioned or even primitive, to move Judaism from what they called the straitjacket, uh, the legalistic straitjacket, into the prophetic tradition. And look, Kaplan really um, was, cared about the prophetic tradition. He kept referring to it. But Kaplan saw this as a repudiation of Judaism because it didn't have any of the Jewish texture that he loved and that he actually felt he needed. It didn't cultivate spirituality. And spirituality is not a word we often use with, with Kaplan, but I'm going to argue through tonight that this was a man who had a quest for spirituality. For example, if you were here last week, Sid described this wonderful shachrit, Kaplan davening in Talas and Tefillin and reading John Dewey, creating a sacred space to look at a text. That's a, that's a quest of spirituality. That's bringing a spiritual sense into the everyday. As for orthodoxy, once he gave up the supernatural origin of Torah for the maintenance of traditional observance, uh, he just could not accept orthodoxy. For Kaplan, at best, Sinai was a metaphor. And Mel Skult writes about uh, Kaplan's orth orthodoxy that Kaplan could, you know, Shavuos. There's no, there's no Sinai, there's no giving of the law. There's no way of revaluing this. He, he, saw no, he saw no use for it. The conservatives, conservatives tried to do what Kaplan wanted, that is to keep the tradition, but to look at it historically. But still, because they claimed that halakha was, I won't say immutable, but can, could only be interpreted uh, in increments, he just found it intellectually unconvincing. And then there was secular Judaism, which he saw as ethics and, ethnic and ethnicity without religion. For a man who thought that the essence, or one of the essences, of the Jewish ethnicity was that it was a religious civilization, Secular uh, Judaism was just not going to cut it. What he wrote, and this is, let me read it and, and annotate it as we go along. It's how he summed up the problem of Jewish life in the teens and the 20s. Neither Jewish life nor Jewish law has responded to the current economic situation. Judaism seems to have reconciled itself to the fact that it becomes increasingly hard to be a Jew. And this, of course, is, a, is, is the problem in the kind of world in which he was living, that where Jews could not guarantee that they would work for religious Jews, could not guarantee they could keep Shabbat, could not guarantee that they would keep kosher. By Jewish life, we mean the communal organization which would concern itself. And I think the word he really meant was which should concern itself with the economic welfare of the Jewish masses and which would take up the cudgel for social justice. By Jewish law, we mean Jewish ethical standards and regulations of economic activity among Jews and a system of jurisprudence which, though not backed by police power, would have sanction. In other words, it's, it's almost like he's recreating some of the old Beit Dins, where everybody accepted the decision without the need for external power because they believed in the source. But when neither Jewish life nor Jewish law becomes to the assistance of the Jewish laborer in his difficulties, both become irrelevant to him. 
Which of these Judaisms did he choose? The answer is none of the above. And what he said is there's no uniform pattern of Jewish life that can meet the needs, note the word needs, of different Jewries, note the plural, any longer. He embraced the exciting new environment that some branches of Judaism tried to ignore, like orthodoxy. It, un it was not over uh, completely successful in ignoring it, or it tasted it and found it bitter. But he, he recognized that the new world would not work for everyone. What he wanted to do was to retain the richness of traditional practice that sanctified Jewish life without necessarily accepting the tra traditional underpinnings. And he could only do this by revaluing practices. What Kaplan wanted to do was what I mentioned in that 1915, 1915 quote, was to look at the function of practices. And if they no longer met that function, to find a way of filling that function with Jewish practice. So he is not transvaluing, and I'm not going to explain the difference, except that he defines transvaluation as sort of almost fraudulently uh, insisting that A always meant A. But looking at how you can have a rich ritual life that meets the functions that it should meet. So he wants to use modern scholarship, recognizing that Torah has evolved, that, that it once reflected a time that no, is no more, that there was human authorship, and there can continue to be human authorship, and that change is not only inevitable, but necessary. The modern view that Torah is the product of long historical process implies that its teaching cannot be more than the reflection of the moral and spiritual attainments of its authors. Note the plural. These attainments may have been ethically superior to those of their contemporaries, but they certainly cannot be expected to be set up as a standard, should be a singular, of belief and action for all times. Okay. The Torah was great. The world has changed, and the Torah itself has evolved. And we know that. We know that once, once there was no temple, Judaism became something very, very different. Well, that evolution has to continue. And he was very concerned about that. Intellectual influences, and I can't discuss all of them. There are far too many. This is a guy who must have read absolutely everything he could get his hands on and never let it go. So start with Darwin, though we could start earlier. There's no creator, and Darwin's theory of natural selection explains, first of all, it does away with the need for supernatural agency, and secondly, it offers a mechanism of change. Let me go back to this. Because this shows his optimism, the way that he would use learning that for other people um, was corrosive for him was, you know, just another opportunity. The Darwinian conception of the descent of man holds forth the promise of man's evolving into a much higher type than he is now. He has so far transcended his animal nature as to possess reason and spirit. So here we're taking uh, Darwin, and we're looking at man and saying, well, the, you know, this, imp this explains the improvement of, of human beings. And it's not difficult to conceive of his destiny as involving the eventual dominance of his rational and ethical sense over his central appetites and sensual lusts. OK, but natural selection implies that those traits which are most useful for survival are the ones that persist. So for, for Kaplan, what's most useful for su survival is the dominance of a rational and ethical sense. Okay, Felix Adler, that's ethical culture. And he studied, he took a course with Felix, Felix Adler, I think it was called Social and Political Theory or something. 
Adler saw religion as a religion of obligation. The group was a living organism, and Kaplan went along with that. Eventually, Adler broke with Jewish practice completely, and at that point, Kaplan had no more use for him. William James and John Dewey, I think at this point, let me say that uh, Kaplan was a sociologist. He was interested in how societies work. These are men who wrote on how societies work, how religions work. It's a naturalist theology, which asserts that we are intimately tied in with the natural world. And there was a concern in both of these men with the ethical value of religion and its contribution to the survival of the group. That's another, that's another theme that's going to run through Kaplan. His primary concern is the survival of the Jewish people. Not the survival of Jews, not a physical matter, but the survival of the Jewish people, which is a historic, cultural uh, matter. And this resonated with Kaplan because his concerns were with survival. He wrote, a religion's validity must be judged by its effectiveness in securing the emergence of a warless uh, world-based society. And so we're getting, we're getting the themes that coming in. They come in pretty early. Then there's Giddings. He took almost half of his courses with Giddings. He had the idea of the collective, collective consciousness as a source of values. I mean, this is Kaplan, that Judaism grows out of the Jewish people. Its values grow out of the Jewish people. Focuses on the function of human institutions and society as a system, conver con again, concerned with survival, not with truth, with survival. Matthew Arnold wrote in, the, uh, I think, the 1870s, 1880s. His goal was to revitalize Christianity in a way that Kaplan was trying for a renewal of Judaism. And it's from Arnold that he actually got the formulation that God is an enduring power that makes for righteousness. And then, of course, all of his studies in social sciences he had a lot of faith in the knowledge of these evolving new social sciences and the larger community. This is a period of a lot of progressive ferment. The labor movement, and Jews were very active in the labor movement. The suffrage movement, and the questions about the, 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 not only the role of women, but the rights of women. Uh, social progressivism was, uh, I won't say it was rampant, I don't think it ever got that good in the United States, but it was in the forefront. And the religions, the social gospel, which saw the Bible as mandating social justice, was strong in Protestant denominations, to some extent also in Catholic. And, you know, this is the world that was shaping Mordechai Kaplan. In the Jewish scene, there's Achad Ha'am, who insisted that you could not have the survival of, of a Jewish settlement in Eretz Yisrael if there wasn't a strong, culturally vibrant, diaspora Jewish community. That that was going to be necessary. He saw the fragility of settlement requiring diaspora strength. Or parrots. Uh, for whom language and culture were intimately tied. I'm, I'm, I put the word new in quotation marks because I'm never sure what's new and what's not. I'm always finding that you can, if you look into Judaism, you can find almost anything. But democracy, egalitarianism, individualism, the relationship of the individual and the community, and pluralism. And I'll unpack those in a minute. He really valued democracy. If our conception of religion is to measure up to the highest ethical aspirations of mankind, it cannot ignore the ethical standard of democracy. It is therefore in the interest of religion itself that freedom of thought 
and its natural outcome, diversity of theology, be henceforth accepted as normal and legitimate. Democracy involved some preconditions or co-conditions. And he took egalitarianism very, very seriously. He took the issue of status seriously. First of all, no kohanim or levi'im. We're all Yisrael. Uh, that's partly a dictate of democracy. It's also the fact that the caste system is intimately tied to the temple, for which he had absolutely no nostalgia. They, there was no function for this, dis, this distinction. The equality of women seemed obvious to him. As I said, this was a period of the suffrage movement, um, where the issue of women's rights and women's position, women's possibilities, was hotly debated. And he was on the progressive, if not radical, side of this. For Orthodox women, there was a major disjunction between this larger society in which they went to school and the society that was fostered in the synagogue and the home. And for Kaplan, that kind of disjunction was not acceptable. We come to this issue of Asher Baharbanu. The idea of Israel as the chosen people must be understood as belonging to a thought world which we no longer inhabit. Nowadays, for any person to call, people to call itself chosen is to be guilty of self-infatuation. Now, he comes to this through this no chosen people in, from two different perspectives, and they both lead the same way. One is this egalitarianism is not only between individuals, but nations have to be considered to be equal. And the second, of course, through what he thinks about God. With regard to the individual and community, democracy focuses on the importance of individual self-realization. And at one point, or many points, Kaplan defines salvation as the quest for individual self-realization. But for Kaplan, it is always within a community. The individual does not stand as a unit alone. So there's a balancing here, which is why it's not necessarily quite so new. And pluralism. Not only should there be, can there be, and must there be many strands of Judaism, they have to have respect for each other. We are not quite there yet, I believe. And uh, we must also have respect for other peoples and other religions. In other words, pluralism comes from the fact that nobody has the truth, if in fact there is a truth. And there are some not so new Jewish values. Central to Kaplan is the idea of the Jewish people as a people. And I think that that precedes Kaplan. It's, it runs through our history that we have a common past and we hope to have a common future. Connected to that is survival and Eretz Yisrael and its relationship to the people. Now he's not one of the people who believes that everybody should go to Israel. Um, he is, however, one of those who asserts very early, in fact, that it's, it's necessary to have a vital Jewish culture in Eretz Yisrael. He isn't just talking about presence, he's talking about culture. He's talking about language. He's talking about uh, that rich texture of life that we sum up as culture. And of course, the relationship of tradition. He had a love-hate relationship with tradition. He loved the feel of it. He didn't like its origins. If the Jewish religion is to have a future, it must have its roots in the tradition of the Jewish people. It must, however, recognize as legitimate both the humanist as well as the supernatural version of that tradition. That, of course, implies that the unity 
and solidarity of the Jewish people have to be raised to the status of a cardinal principle in the Jewish religion. So mutual respect and solidarity. Salvation implies a striving for justice. There's your social justice, tikkun olam. A concern for the rights and dignity of others. These ideals are the essence of democracy and religion in general, but also of Judaism in particular. First of all, Kaplan is not an atheist. He doesn't think the universe is random. He sees an ordered universe. He has a conception of God, which we'll go into more deeply, but this is a spiritual being who is seeking understanding. In the very first issue of the Reconstructionist magazine, which was in 1935, after he had written Judaism as Civilization, he asserts <clears throat> that you know, in affirming that Judaism is a religious civilization, we are affirming the necessity that there be a religion. The, es the question that we have is, what is the content of that religion? The other two lead uh, ideas were Palestine and social justice. But in his 20s, Kaplan had a crisis of faith. The belief in an anthropomorphic or even a formless supernatural being, which intervened, revealed law, um, na a national history, and chose and favored one people over the other, was just not acceptable. But he had a dilemma. He served a large Orthodox congregation whose members, as he put it, blindly followed a dogma he could not accept. He couldn't accept revelation. And yet he was convinced of the intrinsic value of Torah its crucial role for Jewish survival. And he credits Matthew Arnold with the formulation, God is the enduring power that makes for righteousness. Not only did it resolve for him the doubts and conflicts that he had, but it, it raised him to heights. Please note the Sinai um, connection here. It raised him to heights and a vision uh, of what could happen, what could be. In 1913, he turns it around and he says that Judaism is the power in ourself that makes for righteousness. So the God idea is dominant. It's not a supernatural God, and God is process. And we can no longer believe that God is a mighty sovereign or that the universe is the work of his hands. However, we can see that God is manifest in all creativity and in all forms of sovereignty that make for the enhancement of human life. To believe in God means to accept life on the assumption that it harbors conditions in the world uh, that will remove violence and exploitation from human society. In brief, God is the power in the cosmos that gives human life its meaning and its direction. He also said that the fact that our conception of God is functional doesn't imply it's purely subjective, that it's a figment of our imagination. You know, color is subjective, but it, does, uh, color, co but it doesn't you know, mean that there's no reality responsible for what the eye is seeing. I know very well what I mean by God. And mostly now I'm going to go into quotes because I think that abstracting from those quotes really takes away from the flavor. And we're dealing here in flavor as, as much as anything else. God to me is the process that makes for creativity, integration, love, and justice. The function of prayer is to render us conscious of that process. I can react with a sense of holiness and momentousness to existence because it is continually being worked upon by this divine process. And the use of that word divine is an interesting one. So the word God has come to express the highest ideals. 
for which men strive, and at the same time points to the objective fact that the world is so constituted as to make for the realization of those ideals. God is the soul of nature, the creative life of the universe, the sum of all forces making cosmos out of chaos, the antithesis of irrevocable fate and absolute evil. God is a creator. And that which seems impossible today, he may bring to birth tomorrow. God is the power that makes for coordination, cooperation. God is the power that makes for salvation. And he was contemplating Avinu Malkenu. Um, God as, and, and all of, the, all of the attributes we give to God. When we think about the forces in nature which maintain life, we're thinking about God. God is helper and protector. Or when we experience stability, that's God as helper. When the life urge becomes self-aware in man's efforts to shake off intolerable restraint, God as redeemer is manifest. God as redeemer is manifest in man's actions for freedom. The sovereignty of God denotes the primacy of spiritual values in human life. Therefore, man seeks God for meaning, and nothing is fixed, eternally sacred. If there is no one choosing, there can be no chosen people. There's no resurrection, there's no Mashiach ben David. There is a messianic age, we bring it about, it's in this world. He sees that this transnatural God can be a bridge among people, between people, across religions. God is a force for progress, and the cosmos is so st structured as to make for salvation. This is an incredibly optimistic view. I find amazing that a man who lived as long as he did who lived through two world wars, who knew about the Holocaust, could maintain until the end. So why do we have an idea of God? Judaism's conception of God should interest us, not <clears throat> so for what it seeks to tell us concerning the metaphysical nature of the deity, but for the difference it has made in the behavior of the Jew. The very functional definition. It's inevitable. Religion is inevitable. Man seeks God. Man seeks meaning in seeking God. It, religion helps fill in the unknown. What is important is not God. What is important is godliness, the characteristics of the sum of all good things. It, that sense of godliness cultivates responsibility. And as I said, Salvation in this world through, is through human action and cooperation. These ideas he calls Judaism's contribution to spiritual life, the function of worship. There are some principles which must be reckoned with in, re, in reinstating, isn't that a wonderful concept, in reinstating worship as part of the Jewish folk religion. It should intensify one's Jewish consciousness. It should interpret the divine aspect of life as manifest in social idealism. It should emphasize the high worth and potentialities of the individual. And as a final word, it should voice the aspiration of Israel to serve the course of humanity. Now let's eat.